Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Welcome! Thank you for joining us today. We are featuring New York Times bestselling author Jan Brett, who is the writer of more than 35 children's books, including The Nutcracker. The Nutcracker is a traditional Christmas story. It is based on the book The Nutcracker and the Mouse King by E.T.A. Hoffman. During the early 1890s, Russian composer Tchaikovsky wrote the music for the ballet, and the first performance of The Nutcracker took place in Russia in 1892. That's a long time ago. It didn't come, to, it wasn't shown or performed in the United States until the San Francisco Ballet performed it in 1944, which is almost 80 years ago. Since then, it's been woven into American holiday culture. So when you think about the, the, um, the sugar plum fairies dancing in your head or the, the march, right, of wooden soldiers, that is from the Nutcracker. And that's why we're so excited to be here to hear more about this special book. But before we get there, I wanted to make sure everyone out there knows that this holiday season, PBS actually is airing, is broadcasting The Nutcracker and the Mouse King. Let's take a moment and watch the trailer. Please welcome Alan Cumming. The real story of the Nutcracker and the Mouse King. It's just a fairy story, but maybe, just maybe, it's also true. The Nutcracker airs in most places on December 14th, but please check your local listing. Before we begin, we always like to thank our library partners, 1,800 strong across the country, as well as numerous PBS stations who share this important content with all of you. We also want to thank and acknowledge AAA for supporting PBS Books children's programs. But none of this would be possible without viewers like you. So thank you so much for being here today. So now the moment you've been waiting for. It is my extraordinary pleasure to introduce Jan Brett. Jan is a New York Times bestselling, number one bestselling author illustrator of more than 35 picture books, which have sold more than 42 million copies combined. Her books, have been chosen as Best Children's Books of the Year by The New Yorker, Parents, Red Book, and others. Brett lives in Norwell, Massachusetts. Welcome, Jen. Hello. Hi, we're so glad to have you here and can't wait to hear your conversation with the moderator. So today we are so fortunate to have Amy Marshall. Amy Marshall is the artistic director of the Amy Marshall Dance Company and a choreographer. She has spent her early years performing in New York City with companies, Paul Taylor Dance Company, David Parsons, and many more. Born in Kyoto, Japan, she possesses an innate curiosity and passion for cultural history. The essence of her art is dance as a metaphor for life's experiences. After performing for a decade, she started the Amy Marshall Dance Company in 2000. Her motivation to test the physical boundaries of dance through her work establish the unique character of her choreography. She is also, besides choreographing, she also is an associate professor of dance at Hofstra University. Welcome, Amy. Hi, so good to be here, Heather. Nice well, to meet you, Jan. <laughs> nice to meet you. Before we begin, Amy, I thought, I know that you have a bit of a history choreographing with the Nutcracker, so I know, um, I thought you could share a little bit about that, and then, you know, we could go from there. Sure. Well, I, you know, growing up, the Nutcracker has always been in, a big influence to me, and um, a lot of people around me, and I've always loved the story, and I thought I would try something new, 
And I came across a band from Boston. Their name is Shereem. And they had klezmerized part of the mm. Nutcracker. So I decided to make a klezmer Nutcracker. So we went on a little journey looking for oil to various lands. So it was definitely influenced from the actual Nutcracker. And we just came up with um, something new. Um, that's amazing. And I, and I knew that when we spoke, not only were you the right person for this conversation because of your experience with that, but also because of your love, like mine, <laughs> of Jan Brett's many books. Um, and so I, before I, I hand over the reins to you, I just want to remind everyone out there, if you have a question, Put it in the chat, and at the end of the conversation, we'll be asking those live those questions live. So, without further ado, enjoy the conversation. Have fun. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> yes, Jan, I have been such a fan of your work. <laughs> my kids oh, thank you. Books. Yes, my kids have your books, and um, they we bring them out every year. A lot of times around the holidays. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll start by asking uh, a question. Um, so you've been writing and illustrating your books for more than 40 years, and I know that uh, you are considered a children's author, but I love your books and have always thought that your books <laughs> are definitely for people of all ages, the young and the young at heart. Um, you have a, retold stories and folk tales and brought them alive again. What inspired you to write The Nutcracker? Cracker. <sighs> My husband is a musician. He is a bass player in the Boston Symphony. And we've been married for 42 years. And how many times have I sat in Symphony Hall listening to wonderful music, beautiful music, and especially the Nutcracker. And this time of year, it is the one piece of music that makes my imagination explode. And I think everyone has played that game where you're in, in a concert and close your eyes and images appear. And these images were just unstoppable. So even though I don't have a dance background, I thought I would illustrate the orchestral suite. So Tchaikovsky first wrote the ballet, and then he took like the greatest hits from it and made an orchestral piece so that the, the orchestra could play. And um, that's what I illustrated. So the actual ballet has some beautiful music that I don't illustrate, and it's really worth hearing the, the complete ballet, his score for the com complete ballet. But I did have the score for the, uh, the suite in front of me, and so I used it and dove deep into it. And I know so many of the people in the orchestra, that, like the bassoon player is this wonderful um, player. And you probably know in the Chinese dance, there's this bassoon yes. uh, solo that goes oompa, oompa. And it always to me sounded like this dragon coming, oompa, oompa. So I was able to put that in the book. And it just went on from there. It didn't end. I, but I will say it was a little bit daunting because I know that so many dancers are initiated by having to have a role in this wonderful ballet that, that showcases children children dancers. And so they're on stage for the first time, maybe. And some of the roles are quite um, challenging, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Uh, yes, definitely. I think that um, a lot of children, when they start with the ballet academy, they really look up to that chance to become, you know, the sugar plum fairy, oh, fairy. the big role or the, the nutcracker itself. Um, and it has lots, lots of different parts. I think you're, you're right. It, it, daunting is definitely something. With it's a very big, big ballet. And um, I love that you talk about listening to the music and how it brought up these images uh, to you that you were then putting onto paper. It was sort of telling the music was telling you the story, which I think is exactly what Petipa did when they choreographed it. Was what is this story telling me? You know, and um, how to create that storyline using these different characters. And it's it's so interesting, the characters that you chose. And I think as we go on, I want to hear a little bit more about <laughs> how you chose those characters and the musicians that depict the bassoon, et cetera. So, yeah. So I was wondering, um, 
if you have a favorite part of the book that you would like to read and share with us all this evening, that would be wonderful. Yes, I would love to start from the beginning and end when the Mouse King appears. Although I will have to add at the end my favorite line in the book, <laughs> which is just silly. You know how sometimes if you have a favorite book with your children, a few lines will appear that, you know, all of a sudden appear at the breakfast table or in the back of the car. And um, that's when, to me, a children's book really takes, you know, grows legs and becomes part of your family. So this is an easy one because there's so much going on, so many different emotions and, um, and magic that goes on with this story. So it begins. Sounds like Christmas, smells like Christmas. It is Christmas, Marie laughed. Thumps and bumps and jingling bells. I'm ready, whooped her brother Fritz. The doors opened into a magical Christmas party, but Marie would never have, messed, have guessed how magical. Not far away, Uncle Drosselmeyer was gathering the curious creations he had fashioned for Christmas Eve. Uncle Drosselmeyer wheeled in the mysterious boxes. Inside were a trickster and two harlequins. With a turn of his key and a whirr, whirr, and a hum, 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 they danced. The figures were so lifelike, everyone wanted to join the fun and dance along. And what a great role for these dancers in the ballet. But Marie was enthralled by the nutcracker her uncle had placed under the tree. He looks like a real boy, she mused, who has traveled from a place far away. The party goers danced the grand march in the quadrille and, and applauded the beautiful music. Uncle Drosselmeyer arrived at Marie's side. He placed a hazelnut in the nutcracker's mouth. Crack! Out came a perfect nut. Marie beamed. What a surprising fellow he is, she thought. It was late when Marie's mother pleaded with her to say goodnight to the guests, but Marie would not leave the nutcracker. Fritz, wanting to see how he'd worked, had broken the nutcracker, and Marie was helping him get better. When the house was silent, Marie lay awake in her bed. I better check the nutcracker, she thought. She tiptoed past Uncle's old carved clock with a watchful owl on top. In the eerie light, Marie felt awed as the old clock Gong, climb 12, chimed 12, gong. She seemed to be getting smaller, or everything else around her was getting bigger. Strange sounds were coming from inside the walls. Squeaky, scratchy, squeak. Squishy, scratchy, squeak. Then Marie saw a mouse as bold as brass who wore a glittery crown. So that's as far as I'm going to go with that. But this is my favorite line. This is when the nutcracker turns from the nutcracker to a real boy. Then a strong, clear voice called, we will not stand for any mouse invasion or their evil king. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that strikes me funny, but it does. <laughs> Very commanding. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you, Jan. That's it's so wonderful, and all of the um, illustrations are just so filled with wonderful different things to look at every single time we open that book. Well, the best part was making the Mouse King with his chain mail, because <laughs> of course he would have to be prepared for those sword strikes. Yes, exactly, a little tiny chain mail. <laughs> and then the cannons that, that um, actually blow up um, peppermint candies <laughs> yes oh my and gosh and have, swords and all that kind of stuff you must have had fun so you you did speak about fun. oops sorry say that you again did speak about seeing the ballet i was wondering um where you might you know who you might have seen perform the ballet and maybe you had a favorite um depiction of it Oh, well, um, I've, l I've listened to about a zillion YouTube views of it. <laughs> Probably my favorite of that is the Baryshnikov one. But um, the Boston Ballet has done wonderful performances. I have seen that tree grow many, many times <laughs> as a little girl, as um, a mother, and as a grandmother with little ones. And um, they 
you know, you don't have to worry about them squirming and saying, I, I'm hungry. They're just captivated by the whole thing. Glued. Yes, that's yeah. wonderful. Boston Ballet. I Yes, I grew up in New Hampshire, so I know oh. the Boston Ballet. Yes. Yeah, yeah they, have a, they have a wonderful production. And they, you know, the best, one of the exciting things about the performance is going to the parking garage. There are all the little mice and dancers with their hair pulled back and their little ballet bags, you know, like seven six, seven, eight, nine years old, and they're all excited from their performance. And it's, you know, it, you just feel like um, it's so special for them to, to make a work become alive on stage. Yes, it is. Absolutely. That's one of my favorite things to do when I'm teaching children is just watch them when they perform, gain that confidence and become in that, you know, that dream state world. Um, become someone new, different, you know, they, they learn yeah. something about themselves, which is wonderful. And I think that your, your book definitely takes people on that, those same kind of journeys, the, the visual, just you dive right into it, which is really wonderful. And I'm sure yeah, thank the Nutcracker you. will become a staple in everybody's homes now. Uh, they can take it into their home with them. They don't have to go to the ballet all the time. <laughs> right. It's good to see both. Um, so I was wondering if, um, did the ballet influence your depiction of any of your book's characters? We sort of touched on that before. Like, how did you choose which animal? And also, how would you choose each animal to play the instruments? Well, um, the animals playing the instruments, I just, it was more there. You know, how could a, something with a pause play the flute, for example? And so it was a little bit like the anatomy of the creature, uh, which was a little bit, I stretched it. I mean, there are actually <laughs> flute players that have hooves, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just, it just, they just would come to me. I was fun making their little uh, special frock coats all in white, like the snow. And of course the hedgehogs played a big role because they're just animals that I like, but I kind of chose animals from Arctic Russia. I've been to Arctic, Sweden, Arctic, Norway, and then St. Petersburg, which is pretty close to the Arctic Circle. And I pretty much chose animals that lived in that er area. And the hedgehog does not live in the United States. It's definitely a European animal. So all my books set in the New World, no hedgehogs. And no armadillos in the Old World books. <laughs> Interesting. Yes, I love that. I, well, that, that was one of my other questions, too, is that you have... You know, in um, the hat, the, the mitten, hedgy, the hedgehog makes appearances, right? And we see the similarities in, in this book. Do you have some of the same animals make um, appearances in different books? Is there a through line? Yeah, I, you know, I love hedgehogs because it's a wild animal, but be, because of its protective prickles, it can... <laughs> You know, people can have them in their backyard and they can come and eat, you know, some food on their porch or whatever. And they don't really, um, if you, I mean, you would never want to pick one up, but, <laughs> they, you know, they wouldn't hurt you. They, it's not like a um, you know, mountain lion. <laughs> oh, <okay. or> it, <laughs> I don't know. They're just a friendly, the little snout that comes up and, and Very cute. kicks up upwards. And I, I guess really, you know, the original... Beatrix Potter, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. I fell in love with her when I was a little girl. And then, then Alice in Wonderland, my favorite book probably in the world. And it was um, the croquet ball. And the, the croquet game got dismantled because the hedgehogs would then unroll from the little ball That's that they curl up into to protect themselves. And then they walk away, which kind of ruins the game. Right. <laughs> I love that. I just thought that was so cool. And then not having hedgehogs. It took until I was in my probably 30s and we were in England and we went to St. Tiggy Winkles, a hospital for wounded wildlife, which is when I saw my first hedgehog. And then we got um, my, our own pet hedgehog, an African pygmy hedgehog. And do you still have this hedgehog? No, we do oh. not have. Um, we had two, actually. Oh, but they're, they're great pets. So you, you we, really we, could we, pick them up. and. Oh, yeah. They were, the first one especially was very, very tame. And had a little wheel for exercising because they get a little chub. Oh, and was one of them named Hedgie? Yeah, one was it. Well, Hedja. She was a girl. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, that's so cute. That's wonderful. They were very cute. So Jan, I'm also wondering um, what other research you might have been doing in preparation for writing this book. I know yeah. listening, clearly listening to the score. Well, other than listening to the concerts many times, yeah. I, we went to St. Petersburg, which was amazing because number one, they have this museum of ethnology right in St. Petersburg. And it has all these life side figures in like um, vitrines with, with uh, traditional costumes and clothes we saw the ballet and i've heard that you can maybe correct me if i'm wrong but the moscow ballet it's all about the legs and the st petersburg ballet is all about the arms or is it the other way around i'm, I'm not entirely sure i don't know You've if never I've heard of that. That, but yes I, ballet companies well, have were, their particular thing they performed the park which was an amazing ballet i mean our we could hardly get you know how we, we were gripping our seats so hard it was in the um, the very traditional theater there. And um, that when we're at the end of the performance, you couldn't open your hands up because it was just such a stunning performance. It was so captivating. And it, the, it was like being in the olden days, this beautiful theater. And so, and then we also saw um, a folk performances, which will, was amazing and kind of mysterious. Like why do all Russian girls have dimples? Mm. They all have dimples. It's amazing. And they're all beautiful. And they're doing these intricate dances and the tray pack, which was my really fun one to illustrate because it takes in just incredible energy and flexibility. And, you know, go, you could go on about it. And um, so I put that in the book. Russian bears are performing it. <laughs> and then Arctic foxes are doing the dance, Arib, which is the Arabian dance. Arabian. And they're with their tails. It's very sensual. And then what is the last one? Oh, the dragon, uh, which I mentioned before. Right. And it has flying squirrels that, um, and there are flying squirrels in Arctic Russia <laughs> flying yeah. off the dragon's back. And they, um, they drink from a samovar, which in Russia is, you know, it's kind of uh, very, not just traditional, but it's a part of literature, part of their culture. And um, so I, I bought like a pretend one in um not pretend, but chi it's a China one rather than a working one in um, St. Petersburg that I brought home. And the, but the real ones, so there's like a little burner in the center where you make the tea and you pour coals in the outside around it to heat up the water. So you do it outside. You don't need electricity, but then they put pine cones in there. So the fragrance of the smoke mm -hmm. is really lovely. And so I put that in the book. And um, I've yet to get a real working samovar, but it's coming. Oh, that's very interesting. So that, that a lot of that research did show up in the book, like you said. Oh, so yeah. much of it did. And, um, you know, the, a lot of the artifacts that I saw. And then I have my own collection of little nutcrackers. I just bought one. Well, I have more than one here, but this is like a, um, an animal from the Alps, a cami that is a carved one. And then I have a real nutcracker that's like a vintage one that's in the museum at the Norman Rockwell Museum. I'm having a, a, um, a show there. So they wanted that as like a, to see the, the nutcracker that I used. But, um, I've, and I collected them when I was in Europe with the orchestra, the orchestra would go and the Boston Symphony and I would always get to go. To that's them. wonderful. It sounds but like- I have not been to St. Petersburg with the orchestra. We did go to a performance of their orchestra there and the conductor also conducts in Boston. So it was, it was really, and then we went to a, a dacha, which was um, in along the Baltic. And I, 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 the one memory I have that's not in the book, but also why am I mentioning it? But we were out in the woods and I heard this. And I thought, Oh, someone's alarm is going off. And the guide said, we are hundreds of miles from anywhere that's a cuckoo and we don't have them in the United States. So oh, it's, that, it's, yes. I've always been fascinated by cuckoo clocks. So there is a clock in the book and it has that same kind of carving um, of the intricate like cuckoo clock. The owl that comes along. You have alive. to save that for your next book. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so, so I'm just, Jan, I'm just going to give a quick reset for people who might be joining in on us now. Hi everyone. I'm Amy Marshall. I'm here with the internationally acclaimed children's author, Jan Brett, and you're watching PBS Books. A quick reminder, if you've recently joined us, if you have a question for Jan Brett, please share it in the chat and we'll be asking live audience questions very shortly. Thank you very much. 
So Jan, maybe we could talk a little bit about the creative process of your illustrations. Mm. They're absolutely beautiful. Like we said, there's so much in it, particularly in, in the um, Nutcracker one. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you go about doing your illustrations and maybe deciding how many vignettes on the side that you do versus yeah. what's in the main um, well, picture? Yeah, I love that question because I'm sure there are so many people that are writing their own story or they are curious about perhaps doing it. You know, when one of those is that when you say to your parents, there's nothing to do, they, okay, write your own book. Well, this is my book, Dummy. This is how I begin. Well, first I write the story or retell it, which in this case, there's some things in the, from the ETA Hoffman that were, it's a really long story that were, you know, the, some of the other parts I found more interesting I put in and the, some of the other things are left out, hmm. but everyone does that. It's really long, the, the original. But uh, this is the book dummy. So what I'll do is I'll, 32 pages, I make it out of typing paper and I sew it with thread. You wouldn't have to do that. You could just make sure it's 32 pages. And um, <laughs> so here's a picture of uh, the Nutcracker when he's come alive. And I think this is where she throws a shoe. Yes, yeah, she throws a shoe. And then all those little white notes are from my art director and editor who are, Wow. helpfully critical by saying, oh, you got to make the shoe bigger. You can't see it. Or the nutcracker looks, you know, one thing, what does they actually say? Uh, something might be too close to the fold in the center. And does this have borders? Yes. So they, they always uh, chime in and I don't have to do exactly what they say, but uh, they are see hundreds of books. And so they're looking at it from a perspective of, um, you know, kind of a time honored uh, tradition of uh, the per trying to achieve a perfect book. And so I can't do that all by myself because you get tired and you say, oh, you know, I'm done. And then they'll say, but you could do this. <laughs> yes, I could. So they're, they're wonderful. They um, not, it's not just constructive criticism, but it's also just a little bit of coaching, like probably with you, when you have your ballet troupe that you're trying to take those dancers up to another level that maybe they don't even know they could achieve. So if you're writing your own story or illustrating, just remember you want to raise that bar as much as you can. And sometimes I think the best part about being children's illustrator is there's a well of imagination inside all of us. And you just, sometimes it just appears without even being asked. And when it does, that's when you have to respect it and um, go with it and see, see where it leads you. So it's, there is planning. There is a lot of technical, like, right, making sure that everything fits into the page. But what I'm really looking for, and maybe in the dance world this is true as well, is you're waiting for that kind of force that comes from, it's like a human creativity thing that happens. And it's mysterious. And that's the best part about it. That is very, that's true. And that wonderful words for everybody to hear, Jan. And it's it's wonderful to take a peek inside how you create this, because as you said, everybody is a different kind of creator and tapping into it, maybe in one genre or another, but to trust yourself is such good advice and just mm -hmm. let it let it go and see where it takes you. So with that being said, what was maybe one of the biggest challenges with doing such an um, enormous story as the Nutcracker? Well, I mean, it was daunting because of its um, history. So I was a little bit afraid because I did take ballet for maybe three or four years. But I, you know, I have watched so much um, on YouTube and dancers talking <clears throat> about their life and their stretching and their injuries and stuff. You know, I've, I felt a little bit like I was intruding on a, a very special world that involved incredible discipline and incredible talent that is just only given to just a few people that are, are able to be dancers. And like, is it okay for me to step into that territory? So I, the way I kind of solved my problem was thinking more about the music because my husband is a musician and I have gone to so many concerts and I felt like it was a little bit approachable rather than showing the steps. Mm 
but the steps are so much a part of the ballet and the magic. I'm hoping that this will be like the little doorway that people will go through in order to see this greater world of the Nutcracker performed as a ballet. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. And um, having read it myself, I really enjoyed it from that point of view. And I think that, as you said, being honest about um, where your inspiration is coming from and to stick with that is really, uh, it comes through with all of the the details and all of the different storylines that you've picked up that are your own that add to that story and brings us into that world of that winter wonderland. Um, let's, I had one more. Right. Yes. Oh, uh, here's a question for you. Do you ever get stuck when you're when you're coming up with a, a new book or a new illustration, mm. a new page? Do you ever have a writer's block? <laughs> no, I really don't. My my biggest problem is um, or organization. I just take on so much and then I don't have time to do all of that. But I would say that one of the things that really helps me is um, running. I, I'm a runner. And so the running part, I don't know, it's the fresh air, the oxygen going through your system or something, but I often will get a really good idea. Or I'll, the other trick is I will go to sleep and ask myself a question. Like there'll be a sticking point in the book. Mm -hmm. And then I will wake up and say, did I get the answer? Or I will, you know, you just have kind of like an internal computer and you're kind of asking that question and like the, the gears grind away. And then it's like kind of thinking of that word that you can't remember the or someone's name, if you think about it before you go to sleep, sometimes when you wake up, there, there it is. So I use that trick. I tell kids to do that when they're going to sleep because your mind is kind of going from reality to unconsciousness. And there's that little period there where, you know, you can delve deep into your own little reference library in your brain. And so I, I will do that trick in the running thing. But generally, that is not my problem. I certainly have other problems like organization and taking on a little bit too much. Mm. <laughs> yes, that could be a problem. I understand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wearing too many hats sometimes is the trick, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that's that's a great point to raise, too, that there's no real right or wrong answer, but it's just finding a way to go that you can open up a door and keep going. Sometimes yeah, yeah, that's the, your honest um, feeling about what might come next. Um, uh, so do you have any upcoming books or projects? Oh, I'm well, I'm working on um, a muskox story. So the, before the Nutcracker, I did a cozy, which is about a muskox. And now cozy in love is my new one. And I actually have um, a, a spread that shows where a half finished piece of artwork that I'm working on. So I went to Alaska, there's a muskox farm up there and fell in love with these creatures because it's like um, the, they're from the Pleistocene. So this is a page that I've just started. I've got the border shape in intact. I wanna get a little closer so you can see this is Cozy's uh, girlfriend <laughs> and she's, she's uh, finding him. This is probably not the best one, but it was the only one that I had that was halfway done. But this is the a piece from the dummy that's been enlarged, and the editors have, you know, said this was close, too close to the fold, and they've gone through it and helped me out as far as getting things straight. It also has puffins and beluga whales in it, which was really kind of neat because I had to do all the grueling research, like I did with the Nutcracker, going to. St. Petersburg and I went to Alaska and looked at all the sea mammals and got to be got up close and personal with the muskox, which are, they do not smell musky. They smell really good and they're adorable. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Well, we look forward to that very much, Jan. And I think everybody's going to be looking forward to reading the Nutcracker. Oh, and thank you. Looking at these beautiful illustrations. I know I'm going to be reading it many more times because there's so many different things to look at every single time. And I think what right now we'll open up to um, a live chat and see if anybody else has some questions that you may be able to answer for that. I would love that. 
Hi, thanks for inviting me back in. Um, one of the things I thought we could do is alternate where I ask some questions, Amy, you ask others from the chat because there are lots of questions and we, we want to mm -hmm. try to <laughs> So one of the first ones um, is from Facebook and it is how do you keep, a, you have this amazing enthusiasm and this kind of this, this wonder, the sense of wonder. And so the question is how do you keep this sense of wonder alive? That is the viewer's question. I would say that if I, more than art talent, I have this, when I was a little girl, I had an, a really wonderful childhood and my mother and father loved books and storytelling and let us be artists. But I love being a kid. And I think it was terrible when I had to go through my teenage years because I just wanted to stay a kid. But I remember promising myself that I would, um, when I, I loved some of my books and others, I felt they talked down to me and that they were too simple. And I was frustrated by that and kind of not insulted. That's going too far, but a little bit like, hmm, wait a minute, I a little bit can understand it. Because if you think about children, they are very absorbent and vibrant. They don't have experience, but they definitely have the intellect, intellectual um, ability to grasp certain nuances and colors and stuff like who says kids have to like just red yellow and blue you know I loved you know turquoise and teal and magenta you know I can remember in nursery school liking magenta so that's what I promised myself and so I, I'm trying to keep that promise <laughs> that remembering that that feeling when you're six or seven and you like wake up your parents like can I go outside can I do this can I do that and they'll go like oh could you just wait till after breakfast and you know that because you have this enthusiasm and sense of discovery about the world and you know as you get older it kind of goes away so I love to think about those those years about being childlike and I try to think try to do something totally new and it's kind of on the scary side as far as adventuresome wise every year and well and just to support that the fact that you included the, it's called the sum of some of our some of our oh yeah right yeah. I didn't know what that was when I read it and so oh, it yeah. and and I was reading it to a group of five-year-olds and so we like looked it up so we all yeah. knew what it was right and so I love that your books challenge should they challenge us to to learn i'm so glad you said that because my favorite author growing up was beatrix potter and she would say oh the sparrows implored peter to exert himself and so you didn't have exert or implore in your vocabulary but you knew exactly what those were and you went away saying oh i've got a new word i've got a new word and it so i i loved her for that and so i try to do a little bit of that and there's a little bit of a pushback with because a lot of teachers are love books and they want to read to children, but so many of them have reading lists. And so that's kind of their focus that like, what is this big word samovar doing? And it's not even one we use on everyday language. But to me, that's the color, the, the kind of magic of it is having these influences I th i'm trying to think of something that would be visually the same way that i will do chain mail like you would look at that like what what is that what they got on it's chain mail and you learn and that becomes part of their frame of reference so then when they see lord of the rings or um read uh king arthur they'll say oh i know about that chain mail that was in the nutcracker <laughs> So I love that. I love expanding that frame of reference. Amy, do you have the next one? Um, <laughs> I think I'm reading from the, okay, from Peg, where does your initial inspiration and idea come from? Hmm. Well, a lot comes from my pets. <laughs> they always manage to do something. I mean, I find animals much easier to draw than people. I mean, I'm, it's a whole different scale almost. And as a matter of fact, when I first was trying to get jobs as an illustrator, I would always draw animals. And finally, I got an um, editor. I was trying to get a job. And she said, well, Jan, you know, 
it's children that are reading your books. They want to read about other children. I said, well, I just want to do animals. And she said, well, just pretend the animals have got a zipper and they take off their fur and then there's kid inside. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so I started <laughs> doing that. It was very good advice <laughs> that she she gave me. But um, where what, did, what was the question again? <laughs> got no, carried I, away. I think that answered it because it was where okay. do you get your inspiration from? And, yeah, and I, animals. Um, and also the books that I loved as a child. I mean, I, 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 hold, I have so many books in my house. I probably have, I don't know, 5,000 titles. I mean, the, the third floor is the library and it's going to fall through the house someday. <laughs> <laughs> when I go traveling, they always pull me over at customs and go, ma'am, what do you have in your luggage? You know, I think gold bullion. I go, no, it's, it's books. <laughs> and and uh, the other thing is they're mostly in other languages. And so I don't even know what they say, but they have pictures, pictures, you know, especially the Russian ones. That was the one thing about going to St. Petersburg, my books that I brought back, they were so beautiful and amazing. And they're, and, but they're all in Russian. So I do have a few Russian f friends that I have cross-referenced things with, but um, it's not an easy language. It's like it's not like French or uh, Spanish where you kind of know a few words. It's all in Cyrillic, though. Uh, one of the things, and, and Susanna asked um, on Facebook, asked a similar question about your how you illustrate and how in the margins or on the vignettes, like kind of the frame. Um, and I know when I was going through the book, I was wondering how you choose, like how you choose what goes on the side versus the central right. image and also the uniqueness of that, like how you even came up with yeah. that idea yeah. because it, it really carries through so many of your books. Well, yeah. it's not really a long story, but when I first went around with my portfolio to different publishers, um, I, the book I had was showing people was Fritz and the Beautiful Horses, because I had an editor that said, um, you know, I love, I love your work, but rather than trying to find a writer to match your illustrations with, because I really am an illustrator more than a writer. He said, you should write your own story. And I said, well, I can't write. And he goes, well, can you tell stories? And I said, yes. And he said, well, look, tell the story and I will help you. And he said, there's really only like 10 different stories. You can't go home again. I'm different, but then that turns out to be a good thing and on so on. And so that I wrote about horses because my daughter was riding and she had would always fall off the big fancy horses that she wanted to ride. And there was this one little pony that was would stop if he started to fall off. I mean, he was just a, he was like a riding teacher, only he was a, a pony. And so I did that and it had borders. And so the editor said, we don't want any pretty little books. They are not greeting cards. They have to be uh, it's children's literature. Respect the child. And I'm going, that makes a lot of sense. So the next book, so Fritz was published, Fritz and the Beautiful Horses, my first book, Without Borders. And then the next book I wrote, Annie and the Wild Animals, had borders because I put content in them. So I had to force myself to, like I was saying about raising the bar, I had to raise the bar and put um, something that would also went on in, outside the main story. And it gives a lot of flavor. And if I... I just fall in love with the different folk customs and colors of a, a, maybe a different country, or even if it's like with Armadillo Rodeo, the West with all the, um, or j every book has its own little palette of color. And it's another place I can do that to add to the atmosphere of the story. And I can put, um, <sighs> things that would uh, the, the complexity of the characters to bring it forward a little bit. So like, let's take the hat. Um, Hedgy is got a, a sock stuck on his head and he's trying to pretend that it's not a big deal because all the animals are kind of making fun of him. And, but he's, he's grimacing as he's trying to get it off. And, but in the meantime, he's saying, Oh, it's my hat. I'm wearing it to keep warm, blah, blah, blah. And so I can do that in the borders. I can make this nuanced character by having different versions of it and reactions from other animals. And children really understand that. They understand metaphor. And I want, and I think they're, um, they're fascinated by complexity, complex characters. They know themselves like first day back at school. 
you know, like the day before you go, let's say your parents take you to a campground and you're going and you're swimming in the river and having hot, you know, a campfire with cookout kind of stuff. And you're really happy to be there. It's a beautiful day. But then in the back of your mind, you're thinking, you know, are my shoes going to be too small? Will my best friend be in my class? So you're excited, but you're also a little bit like planning and not really worried, but just on the cusp of being worried. So that's the way you feel. And children really understand that about characters. And that's why that um, I try to do that in my book. I don't want to just make it just this cardboard cutout. And I'm not saying it has to do with detail either, because a lot of cartoons, I'm not a cartoonist, but just a little change in the eyebrow or the, I mean, that's their gift is be able to in, uh, distill. It's almost like a poem distilling these different um, aspects of the character into these very nuanced little shapes and um, uh, 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 the cartoon artwork. So that's what I try to do. That's Incredible. wonderful. Jan, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about where you're sitting and what kind of medium that you are using when you're oh. making illustrations. Well, that's not too interesting. I just have watercolors. I have a whole bunch of brushes. I mean, these are, I have like 10 of these with all my brushes. Like which one is going to be the perfect one? <laughs> then I have... Um, Watercolors. Oh, I've got to show you that. That might be interesting because I, I like to show this to kids. They go, ooh, <laughs> because it's so messy. But I always say to them, you know, I don't use, like, there are very few times in nature that you see bright yellow, bright blue, bright green. Usually there's, like, changes and the way the light falls on a character. So you could have a perfectly... Oh, let's say it's a dolphin and it's under the water and there's different rays of light coming through the ocean. So it will kind of shape, make the dolphin look different. The blue of blue gray of the dolphin, the dolphin blue. And um, so that's what I try to do. And a lot of times I'll do it by layering the colors. So I would say if you're a kid, I have a lot of these markers and I don't use them in my books, but you can layer different colors and you get this vibrancy. Like if you could go with a microscope and go on a molecular level, you would see these little dots of color that are absorbed into the paper or would stay on top of the paper and they kind of dance around and they create a lively effect. So um, I think a lot of I learned that from going to museums and looking at, you know, the old masters and the impressionists of how they create this light on objects and make them come alive and interest us because we're sophisticated creatures where our eyes are like so beyond what we can even acknowledge of what we're seeing foreground background and you kind of as an illustrator try to parse that out and when you're working on a book trying to create that and it's very hard. I'm, I'm not even halfway there. I'm not even a quarter of the way there because um, the world is such an amazing place. I mean, I have this bracelet. It's like a, a Navajo prayer kind of thing. And you say, you face to the north and you say, I walk in beauty. And then you face to the east and you say, I walk with beauty around you. And it goes on to all the points of the compass. And it just never stops unfolding. It's like a moving river of beauty that I try to capture or even attempt to capture. It's audacious to try to capture it. But on the other hand, there were when we were primitive people in the caves of France making those beautiful cave drawings with animals that are now extinct on the walls, mm -hmm. They have such incredible beauty. So this is inherited in our nature. So I, I get, that gives me solace. Like, okay, they were doing it way back then. I guess I can still try my best to uh, recreate some of the wonderful things that the world is showering on us. Yes, and you do, Jan. You absolutely do. Very vividly. <laughs> <laughs> this has been an incredible conversation. And, and, Unfortunately, I know there are a lot of questions out there that have gone unanswered and, and we acknowledge that and we are sorry, but we do need to close this, this conversation. Jan, we are so thankful 
to you for your incredible creativity and vision and understanding of young people. Um, and you create such works of art in each book you create. Um, and you challenge our children to be the best the best they can be, to be curious, to ask questions, to look at details, to make their own narratives and, and to start telling stories. It's just incredible. So thank you so much for, for sharing your talent with us and for sharing this hour with us. <laughs> um, Amy, thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for nice moderating the conversation. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Um, and I hope we will see you both again at some point. Once again, I just want to thank all of you out there for joining us today and thank AAA for supporting the children's programs that PBS Books um, is able to share with our community. Don't forget to catch the Nutcracker and the Mouse King on PBS next week. Check your local listing. And this is the end of the show. So I'm Heather Marie Montilla. You've been watching PBS Books, and we hope you enjoy your evening. Good night.